uh, good evening doctors i am dr stalin on behalf of shield healthcare welcoming you all for today's webinar so the topic for today's webinar is uh, tls in pcos i request the participants to post their queries in the comment box so that we can have the short qa session at the end of the presentation now it's time to introduce our uh, renowned speaker dr uh, professor uh, shanti gunasingh ma'am uh, madam actually needs no introduction madam is familiar to all the gynecologists in the city and in various parts of india so madam as uh, madam was the past president of oxy and madam was the former director and super medical uh, superintendent of uh, iog chennai former director superintendent of uh, iso kg triplicane and former hod of kilpak medical college and served as the project director for center of excellence for tubal microsurgery in kmc for 6 years madam was the past president women doctors association tamil nadu and uh, executive committee members chennai menopause society uh, madam has received uh, dr al mudalya award for traveling fellowship in 1993 and madam has been invited as a uh, speaker in various uh, national and state level conferences uh, with this introduction i welcome you ma'am and uh, before going to the session i would like to play a one minute video on our shield connect web page ma'am uh, so chitrakala will be playing a one minute video and following the video we can start our presentation chitra you can play the video now Uh, so, ma'am, uh, there is some technical issues, I guess, ma'am. Now we can start the presentation, ma'am. Uh, over to you, ma'am. Thank you very much. Shall I share as my screen? Yes, ma'am. We can share now, ma'am. Can you see it? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So, uh, good evening to one and all. Uh, I thank Shield uh, Healthcare for having given me an opportunity to talk on pulse in PCOS. Uh, we know that PCOS is the most common endocrine disorder among women, and it affects five to fifteen percent of the reproductive female population. Hyperinsulinemia is always present. and obesity is present in 80% of women with pcos and it exacerbates the metabolic risk associated with hyperinsulinemia 50% seek fertility services directly and 70% of pcos women remain undiagnosed because of their ignorance until such time when they seek assistance for conception so it is a heterogeneous disorder with symptoms and signs of androgen excess ovarian dysfunction polycystic ovarian morphology so androgen excess can be clinical hyperandrogenism or it can be biochemical clinical in the form of hirsutism acne male pattern baldness and or hyperandrogenemia and uh, it is essentially a diagnosis of exclusion lot of disorders mimic pcos so it's important to exclude thyroid disorders hyperplaquemia Cushing syndrome, androgen secreting neoplasms, and non-classic congenital adrenal hyperplasia. So it is a, although we have lot of diagnostic criteria, the Rotterdam diagnostic criteria is used where three points are noted: one, oligor and ovulation; two, clinical and or biochemical uh, signs of hyperandrogenism; three, polycystic ovary. any two of the three and exclusion of other pathologies so uh, when the pcos begin it seems to begin in the womb itself female offspring exposed in utero to high levels of androgen may be predisposed to pcos following puberty this hyperandrogenism is a result of raised maternal androgen or it can be from the fetal adrenal ovary 
or even from a dysfunctional placenta. A review of 82 studies have shown that hyperandrogenic intrauterine environment programs the genes concerned with ovarian steroidogenesis, insulin metabolism, gonadotropin secretion, and ovarian follicle development, resulting in PCOS in adult life. So it essentially begins in the womb. So we also know that it is a complex multigenic disorder in which predisposing genetic variants interact with strong environmental influences to result in different PCOS phenotypes. 10% of PCOS said to be heritable and in Han Chinese population, the susceptibility loci were found on 2P163, 2P21, 9Q33.3. But in Europeans, 2P16.3 was found to be the susceptibility locus. If a mother has PCOS, then there's 20% chance, the chance that the um, lady might uh, uh, develop PCOS. And if a sister is having PCOS, 40% chance. So what is the pathophysiology? So it is essentially insulin receptor dysfunction where there is excessive serine phosphorylation instead of tyrosine. And then hyperinsulinemia is a sheet anchor. And this hyperinsulinemia acts on the adrenals and that leads to increased DHEAS. It also acts on the ovarian stroma. The theca cells also produce androgens, so hyperandrogenemia. It acts on the follicle and there is decreased aromatization of androgens by granulosa cells, and that also leads to increased androgens. So it acts on the pituitary, and there is increased LH. And there is also reduced sex hormone binding globulin, and this leads to increased free androgen. So ultimately, hyperinsulinemia and hyperandrogenemia. And we also know that environmental factors play an important role in the early stages by uh, converting a predisposed genotype to the phenotypic expression of PCOS. So if they have unhealthy uh, habits like high fat, yeah, taking uh, high fat, low fiber diet, a sedentary lifestyle, smoking or alcohol consumption, then this can make them prone for all these. And when they become pregnant, there can be insult to fetal placental unit, resulting in fetal growth restriction. So this will permanently pro uh, program the uh, metabolic uh, function and you have a small for gestational age or in a fetal growth restricted child. And when the thrifty phenotype acts on that, they become overweight in childhood. And if they are uh, following unhealthy habits, then this will perpetuate. On the other hand, if they have healthy habits, then they can have a healthy pregnancy and they can deliver a healthy child. And so uh, do EDCs, that is endocrine disrupting chemicals in the environment, play a role in the PC, uh, PCOS? This uh, bisphenol A, this is said to be found in plastic and in so many other things. This has obesogenic properties. And data suggests that bisphenol A concentrations are higher in women with PCOS than in others, but the direction of causality has not been established. So we also know that PCOS is not a single entity. There are four phenotypes. The uh, first one, that is the Frank one or phenotype A. Here we have hyperandrogenism, chronic anovulation, and polycystic ovaries and ultrasound, prevalence about 40 to 70 percent, and long term risks are known. Uh, on the other hand, we have the classic B uh, uh, phenotype where hyperandrogenism is there, chronic anovulation is there, and PCO can be plus or minus, prevalence about 70 to 40 percent, and here also the long term risks are known. Then we have the ovulatory ones where hyperandrogenism and polycystic ovaries are there, but they ovulate regularly, seven to, seen in 7 to 20%, 9 to 
long-term risks are unknown. Then we have the mild variety, that is the D, where you have chronic anovulation, PCO, but then hyperandrogenism uh, might or might not be there, prevalence about 7 to 14%, and long-term risks are unknown. And we have a lot of ethnic variations too. In Caucasians, they have a very high BMI. For South Asians like us, the main thing is central adiposity, type 2 diabetes mellitus, metabolic risk, acanthosis. So uh, essentially, we have metabolic dysfunction. So what are the main concerns of PCOS? It can be threefold. One is anovulation. So you can have menstrual irregularity, infertility, endometrial hyperplasia and cancer, androgen excess, so hysticism, scalp hair loss, acne, and this negative body image can lead on to depression. Metabolic dysfunction, where obesity, type 2 diabetes mellitus, dyslipidemia, sleep apnea, and non-alcoholic steatoric hepatitis can develop. So prevalence of PCOS in India is about 11.96%. So coming to adolescent PCOS, the signs and symptoms of PCOS overlap the physiological changes of puberty. That uh, point we should take into mind. So they can have menstrual pattern, uh, which can be irregular, but we should not dub them as PCOS immediately. And this actually, there's a lot of uh, other societies, pediatric endocrine society, endocrine society, all these talk about all three Rotterdam criteria to make a diagnosis of PCOS in adolescents. But then uh, Ashri in 2018 recommended that in adolescents, androgen excess and ovulatory dysfunction more than two years post menarche is diagnostic of PCOS. So these two would suffice. We need not do ultrasound to see polycystic ovaries at all. Ultrasound is done only after eight years of gynecological age. That means eight years of menarche. But for adults, of course, uh, it has to be considered. So, uh, no USG up, up to eight years post menarche. This is because multicystic ovaries are common post menarche. If they are socially and uh, sexually active, then TVS is probably preferred. And follicles 20 or more arranged in the periphery of the ovary in a pearl necklace like pattern. Earlier, it was 12 follicles, but now 2018 guidelines, it is 20 follicles. So follicle number per ovary appears to be the most sensitive and specific ovarian ultrasound marker. And ovarian volume more than 10 ml is also important. No corpus luteum should be there. Cis, no cis, and no dominant follicles when this is being diagnosed. So what are the tests we will be doing? A battery of tests have been given, but then various societies have recommended only few tests. So free testosterone is not done in our part of the country. This is because it, uh, the estimation has not been standardized. Ideal would be free testosterone, but because of the improper standardization, we have to do only total testosterone. If it is too high, then we have to roll out androgen uh, secreting neoplasm. Sex hormone binding globulin also need not be done. Luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone are done on day two or day three, that is basal evaluation. And their ratio can also be identified. DHEAS uh, will also be increased. 17 hydroxy progesterone should be done along with LH and FSH on day two or day three to screen for late onset congenital adrenal hyperplasia. If it is increased more than six nanomoles per liter, then ACTH stimulation test should be done to confirm uh, late onset congenital adren adrenal hyperplasia. Androstenedione should be done, it will be increased. Important to do thyroid profile and prolactin because hypothyroid, uh, thyroidism and hyperprolactinemia 
may cause irregular menses. And lipid profile is very, very important, especially in, uh, for the Indians, even if they are thin. For Westerners, they do, uh, do it if the patient is obese. But for us, since metabolically, we are prone for all these complications, uh, oral glucose tolerance test is also very, very important. And ALT and AST is also important to screen for NASH, especially family history is positive. So what are the goals of treatment? One, management of irregular cycles. Two, amelioration of hyperandrogenic features. Three, ovulation induction for infertility. Four, management of underlying metabolic abnormalities. And five, prevention of endometrial hyperplasia and cancer. So coming to treatment for abnormal uterine bleeding, this menstrual irregularity has to be corrected. And treatment is aimed at reducing chronic anovulatory cycles, which increase the risk of endometrial hyperplasia and subsequently endometrial cancer. Psychosocial support is mandatory. Combined oral contraceptive pills um, are, are, is a sheet anchor. And progestin also, especially in adolescent, that can be given once in two to three months. Uh, it can be uh, given so that they get withdrawal bleed. Either a synthetic progesterone or diadrogesterone are administered in the second half of the cycle. And due to heavy menstrual bleeding, anemia also needs immediate attention. So what is the preferred combined oral contraceptive pill? All have similar eff efficacy. Lowest effective uh, estrogen doses are preferred. And first and second generations uh, should be used for acute menorrhagia. Uh, that is norepisterone and norethindrone. And third and fourth generation, not just image, just odine, all that is used for regularizing cycle. And uh, earlier, we used to talk a lot about cyclotironestic preparation containing a COCP, but then they should not be considered first line in PCOS due to the venous thromboembolic risk. And COCP with third or fourth generation progestins are preferred for control of acne. And uh, how do we identify the hyperandrogenism clinically? So it can be either histotism, alopecia, or acne. Histotism is uh, uh, actually assessed by modified Ferryman Galloway score and alopecia by Ludwig Visual score. And acne storing system is there. And that will also tell us because acne is quite common in adults, uh, adolescents. So whether it is really significant can be done only with the acne scoring system. So what is the treatment for histotism? So cosmetic hair removal methods like bleaching, chemical epilation, plucking, waxing, shaving, electrolysis, and laser hair removal. And photoepilation is the first line management of localized histotism in PCOS. And topical aflonathin is recommended as an adjuvant to photoepilation in uh, laser-resistant facial histotism or in women in whom photoepilation cannot be done. But the most important thing is they should be started on oral contraceptives or metformin. That itself will reduce um, uh, hair growth to a certain extent. After that, it would be uh, wise to go in for cosmetic measures. They have to be done repeatedly. Only after if they do not respond to three to six months of uh, these measures, then antiandrogens are added. For acne, we have antibiotic and topical therapies, tetracycline, erythromycin, minocycline, antiandrogen therapy, and topical non-steroidal antiandrogen, uh, benzoyl peroxide, and tretinoin. For alopecia, 2% minoxidil with antiandrogen therapy. So for male pattern baldness, it is ideal to start them on anti-androgen therapy. In that event, they have to be put on contraceptives too. Otherwise, if they become uh, pregnant, uh, then there uh, they can be a problem with the male fetus. So we know that lifestyle interventions are the sheet anchor. Healthy eating and regular physical activity is important. And achievable goals such as 5 to 10% weight loss yield significant clinical improvements. And smart goal setting, that is specific, measurable, 
achievable, realistic, and timely goal setting and self monitoring can enable achievement of realistic lifestyle goals. So, coming to exercise, so for 18 to 64 years, a minimum of 150 minutes per week of moderate intensity, that is like brisk walking, or 75 minutes per week of vigorous intensity, that will be jogging or running. In adolescence, it should be uh, 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous intensity physical activity every day. Suppose they are not able to devote that much time. They should, as uh, if they are studying for their uh, board exams, then they should be for, um, performed in at least 10 minute about or around 10,000 uh, steps. So about should contain in at least 1,000 steps and uh, should last for 10 minutes. Like that, they have to do it repeatedly. And what about yoga asanas for PCOS? It, uh, uh, scientific evidence clearly states that yoga has preventive as well as curative potential. Surya Namaskar, Sukta Ban Konasan, Halasana, Danurasana, Bujangasana, Chakki Chalanasana, Padmasana, and Naukasana, all of them help. Now there is a lot of stress on cognitive behavioral interventions, which include goal setting, self-monitoring, stimulus control, problem solving, assertiveness training, mindful eating. So mindful eating is very, very important that really goes a long way and reinforcing changes and relapse prevention. There should be an energy deficit of 30% or 500 to 750 kilocals per day, but then that will depend on the body weight, physical activity levels. So individualized approach is mandatory and emotional well-being should be at risk. So um, we have the Indian Dietetic Association guidelines for PCOS. Protein should be taken first. Plenty of fresh vegetables in main meals. So we have to eat our rainbow. Eat nuts, good quality fats. Complex carbohydrates like whole grains, like brown rice, whole wheat and millets. And cooking fat like monounsaturated fatty acid. Uh, like uh, groundnut oil, rice bran oil, mustard oil, which have to be changed every month, three to four teaspoons only per person per day. Avoid trans fat and saturated fats. So all bakery foods ready to eat snacks are out. And there is a lot of stress on anti-inflammatory agents like turmeric, cinnamon and amla and decreased dietary advanced uh, glycosic, glycated uh, end products by decreasing animal-derived foods, processed foods, grilling, and roasting. And uh, what about dairy intake? Nowadays, everybody says that anything white should be should not be taken, like sugar, excess sugar, salt, and uh, milk is also nowadays included in that. So dairy products stimulate insulin growth factor one, resulting in high insulin levels but skimmed and whole milk should be avoided, but not cheese products. So milk contains growth stimulating hormones. So this increases androgens resulting in higher sebum production and acne. So this has been clearly, I mean, uh, classified in the role of medical nutrition therapy for acne. And also the DASH eating pattern for which we use for uh, hypertension. That also improves insulin resistance, so, uh, serum high sensitivity, CRP levels, abdominal fat accumulation, overweight women with PCOS. Intermittent fasting is the order of the day. This reduces IGF-1 and IGF-BP-1, and they have a beneficial effect on ovarian function, androgen excess, and infertility in PCOS women. So what about pharmacological treatment for non-fertility indications? So the main thing is OCPs are the first line. So any uh, OCP can be used, but then we have to follow the WHO recommendation, the WHO guidelines for uh, relative and absolute contraindication and risk. And then uh, uh, earlier, as I said earlier, this 35 microgram uh, ethanol estradiol by cyprotridone as tape that is not the first line in PCOS anymore. And we have to also consider additional 
risk factors peculiar to PCOS like high BMI, uh, hyperlipidemia, and hypertension too. So first line is say a COCP. What about metformin? So metformin is most beneficial in high uh, metabolic groups, including those with diabetes risk factors, impaired glucose tolerance, and high risk ethnic factors. So we Indians fall into that. So probably metformin is uh, good for us. And coming to antiandrogens, they have to be considered only for androgenic alopecia and considered for hysteticism only if others fail. And metformin appears safe long-term, but then it is very important for us to add vitamin B12 also because it uh, affects the uh, vitamin B12 absorption. So now inositols are also emerging as a new therapy. So metformin, only if insulin resistance is proved, but for us ethnically, probably it is helpful because we fall into the category of high metabolic risk groups. And for induction of ovulation, it can be given with uh, uh, gonadotrophins. It prevents uh, OHSS, not recommended for weight loss, but it does not mean it is uh, not said to prevent pregnancy complications of PCOS like GDM, preeclampsia, preterm birth or miscarriage. But then nowadays there are a lot of papers which talk about decreased miscarriage rates with uh, in PCOS uh, pregnancies if continued in first trimester. Are inositols active, effective in the treatment of PCOS? Myoinositol and dechiroinositol are nutritional supplements that act as second messenger and have been shown to play a role in insulin signaling transduction. So they have good metabolic, hormonal, and ovulatory benefits. They increase insulin sensitivity and uh, glucose utilization. Menstrual cycle uh, is restored, improvement in weight loss, and significant improvement in hyperandrogenism. We talked about non-fertility treatment. Now coming to fertility treatment, ESHRI states that the first line of treatment is letrozole, clomiphene citrate, uh, CC plus metformin, metformin, and gonadotropins. Second line, gonadotropins and laparoscopic ovarian surgery. And third is the IVF. So here, ESHRI has clearly stated that letrozole, COCPs, metformin, other pharmacological treatments are generally off-label in PCOS because pharmaceutical companies have not applied for approval in PCOS. However, their use is evidence-based and is allowed in many countries. So it can be used. So in infertility, letrozole is a preferred overlogen. Low dose step up or step down regime of gonadotropin is the next option. OHSS is seen in 10%. Metformin decreases it. In IVF, antagonist cycle is preferred with agonist trigger. Frozen cycle is better than, uh, so a frozen cycle is preferred. Cochrane recommends in vitro maturation to be better in PCOS. Then uh, what about the use of oral contraceptive pills in PCOS uh, women in India? This is actually uh, published by the PCOS Society of India. And here, although we always say that uh, it decreases the LH, it reduces the ovarian antigen, uh, they clearly state that the evidence is low. And what about the timing of induction of ovulation? Important to optimize weight. And especially if they've had bariatric surgery, they have to, uh, uh, it, we have to wait till cessation of the rapid weight loss phase and then only induce a Strict control of sugars is mandatory. Treat hypothyroidism and hyperplaquemia prior to induction. Role of ovarian drilling is, uh, is, um, is really questionable because it, uh, it has limited role in improving ovulation and that too only for a short period. And it does not improve insulin resistance, which leads to metabolic problems. And we also know about not more than four punctures, not more than four millimeter depths, not more than 40 watts. And it reduces ovarian reserve and increased risk of addition. 
but then in some women with chronically elevated chronically elevated LH, probably it is a choice. And what about pregnancy outcome in women with PCOS? So there are pregnancy complications like uh, spontaneous miscarriage, GDM, gestational hypertension, neonatal complications requiring NICU admissions are higher in women with PCOS. And it is a high risk pregnancy that we know very clearly. And what about the consensus statement on the use of oral contraceptive pills in polycystic ovarian syndrome uh, women in India? We saw that uh, although it is used extensively, the evidence is low. But then if they just want withdrawal bleed, progestin only contraceptive pill or a levonorgestrel containing intrauterine system can be used in PCOS in, uh, if, if the estrogen is contraindicated or when androgen excess does not exist. But the evidence is only low. And depo medroxyprogesterone and etinogestrel containing implant should not be used in women with PCOS. This also evidence is low. Women with PCOS have impaired quality of life and higher rates of depression and anxiety, but efficacy and safety of antidepressant therapy is not established. And obstructive sleep apnea is highly prevalent in women with PCOS, and it has adverse cardiometabolic consequences. So even in young obese women with PCOS, successful treatment of OSA with CPAP improves insulin sensitivity, decreases sympathetic output, and reduces diastolic blood pressure. What about long-term consequences of PCOS? So we always say that we have greater odds for elevated cardiovascular disease risk markers and preeclampsia is four times higher. And there are also risk factors for developing atherosclerotic conditions, hypertension and myocardial infarction at an earlier age than in women without PCOS. But then there has been a commentary uh, by Enrico Carmina and Roger A. Lobo in November 2018, where they state there is no increased risk unless they are obese or diabetic. And this is seen mainly in classic patients as per Rotterdam, as spectrum of risk is modified by weight and familial and genetic profile. And more than 20% of women uh, obese women with PCOS have impaired glucose tolerance from 30 years onwards and the prevalence of type 2 diabetes is seven times higher and increased prevalence of BTE, venous thromboembolism and this is a function of age. So as age advances in PCOS women, BTE uh, incidence also increases. Now there is a lot of stress on non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, which seems to be a cause of liver cell failure. This is increased in women with PCOS. Weight loss and metformin improves metabolic and hepatic function. Endometrial cancer risk has also increased 2.7 fold. And uh, this is due to dysregulation of the signaling pathway and the progesterone resistance. Uh, ovarian cancer risk is also increased as per CASH study. So it is higher in never uses of OC, uh, OCPs. So it's very important probably to use OCPs in such patients so that ovarian cancer risk also decreases. What about breast cancer? No increased risk, but then risk uh, earlier was thought to be increased. That was due to obesity, hyperdysmemia, IGF activity and metformin also decreases breast cancer activity. Metformin seems to have a lot of pleiotrophic effect. And uh, what about PCOS and menopause? Women with PCOS enter menopause later. Hyperandrogenemia and hysteticism persists but decrease. Less menopausal symptoms, but more vaginal dryness. Lower prevalence of hypothyroidism and insulin resistance increases with age. What is this dogma theory of PCOS? Dysbiosis of gut microbiota due to high sugar, high fat, and low dietary fiber intake. So this will result in increase in gut mucosal permeability, 
So what will happen is there will be a passage of lipopolysaccharides from gram-negative colonic bacteria into the systemic circulation. So because of that, immune system is activated. So this will increase the insulin level. So this is the uh, uh, high fat, uh, high sugar, low fiber diet. Obesity per se will alter the gut um, microbiome. So because of that, there'll be a leaky gut and this will result in increase in the insulin resistance. So this will result in PCOS. And also the stool microbiome of PCOS patients showed a lower diversity and an altered phylogenetic composition compared to controls. So probiotic or prebiotic treatment increases the number of beneficial good bacteria in the colon. So these beneficial good bacteria produce short chain fatty acids that will uh, increase the colonic mucosal production and tight uh, junction formation. So because of that, leaky gut will be prevented. And, uh, and there is also increased production of the satiety hormone GLP-1 by the healthy colon mucosa. This will also reduce the food intake and result in a decrease in body fat content. What about nutritional supplements? We know that vitamin B12 should be given, especially when metformin is given. Fish oil contains omega-3 fatty acids, which is said to have a positive effect. Vitamin D increases the insulin receptor sensitivity. So it's really very good. And myoinostol treatment ameliorates insulin resistance and body weight and improves ovarian activity in PCOS patients. N-acetylcysteine is also proved effective in inducing or augmenting ovulation in polycystic ovarian patients. So 1.2 to 1.8 grams per day. And uh, PCOS is associated with elevated prenatal testosterone. So PCOS patients find it difficult to conceive. Once conceived also, they can give rise to autistic babies. So the prenatal sex steroid therapy hypothesizes that women with PCOS would have heightened autistic traits and an increased rate of autism among their children. I saw certain articles which talk about the beneficial effect of myoinostol on autism. Uh, no guidelines as such, but there are few papers. So probably we have to promote the use of uh, myoinostol, uh, all these inostol to a certain extent. And all these uh, are, uh, inostols are available in citrus, beans, sesame seeds, yellow, brown rice, corn, wheat bran. So probably when we talk about diet to these uh, women, we have to stress on that too. So to conclude, PCOS is a multifactorial heterogeneous disorder affecting the women of reproductive age. Genetic, neuroendocrine, metabolic, environmental, dogma, and lifestyle-related factors are known to cause uh, PCOS. High prevalence of PCOS in adolescent and adult females, and most of the time, it remains undiagnosed. No USG for diagnosis of adolescent PCOS till eight years of gynecological age. Rotterdam criteria for diagnosis of adult PCOS. AMH not used for diagnosis. Serum insulin need not be measured. Treatment should include lifestyle modification, physical activity, yoga, diet, pharmacological interventions, algorithms recommended by H3 ASRM 2018 guidelines. Insulin sensitizers like metformin and inositols are eff efficacious and safe. Depression and anxiety to be taken care of. Combined OCPIL's first-line therapy and uh, progesterone withdrawal once in two to three months for menstrual irregularity and cancer prevention. Metformin, especially when there are metabolic features, may be continued in first trimester. Letrozole, first line for infertility. And caution must be exercised prior to induction to avoid OHSs. Gonadotrophin, second line in infertility. PCOS leads to poor pregnancy outcome. Long-term consequences include metabolic cardiovascular and cancer risk, risk of autism in the children of PCOS women. We, have, we as gynecologists have to promote triennial screening for metabolic syndrome, 
after 30 years. So thank you very much for the patient hearing. And I thank Shield Healthcare for having given me an opportunity to share my views with you. Thank you once again. Yeah, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you very much for your wonderful presentation, ma'am. Uh, with your presentation, we can be able to understand that the treatment of PCOS has to be targeted to each patient's uh, phenotype, ma'am. So thank you, ma'am. Uh, it's an honor here listening to you, ma'am. So if there is any questions in the chat box, I will read you uh, read it for you, ma'am. Ma'am, and I have uh, questions, ma'am. In what uh, conditions that ovarian drilling, drilling should not be done in PCOS patients, ma'am? When ovarian drilling is indicated only in certain patients when there is refractory anovulatory infertility, when there is tonic elevation of LH. So in all other conditions, this should not be done. And, ma'am... Uh, and nowadays, especially all these uh, uh, surgeons doing... Um, uh, laparoscopy. They even for uh, unmarried women, they immediately do an ovarian drilling, which is to be condemned. Actually, yes, ma'am. Ma ma uh, uh, how to treat this uh, gut dysbiosis in PCOS? What will be the treat of, uh, treatment option, ma'am? Yeah, that will be probiotic and prebiotic. So uh, it is essentially uh, what we mean by that is. Uh, all these prebiotic means uh, certain uh, food uh, substances like onion, garlic, all these, they help the uh, barley, then uh, oats, apple, flaxseed especially. So much talk about fat flaxseed. So all these actually promote the uh, good gut bacteria to uh, promote the gut integrity. Then we have the probiotics like yogurt, uh, so that also will really help. So ultimately it acts through, so we have to ask them to take more of yogurt and uh, onions, then garlic, apple, flaxseed, etc. Uh, Ma'am, whether myonositol should be combined with metformin for the beneficial effects or myonositol is, uh, uh, that is, individual uh, therapy is enough, ma'am. See, now for our uh, ethnic population, I think metformin has to be given uh, with myonistol. Uh, so especially we are prone for that even 16, 17, we see impaired glucose tolerance. Even without impaired glucose tolerance, we see a lot of dyslipidemia even in thin PCOS. So I think probably we have to combine both uh, for to have a good effect. Okay, ma'am, ma and you are talking about this uh, myonistol is, can be treated in autism. Uh, there are some research articles which shows that this prebiotics and probiotics can be treated for this uh, autism also, ma'am. Yeah. So is there any link with this uh, in between these two criteria? See, all uh, nowadays, uh, uh, that is uh, prebiotics, probiotics, like uh, Sarvaroga Nivarani Marta, vitamin D, Madri. Uh, they talk see, uh, so much about that. So really, we do not have any evidence, but lot of papers which link all these things. So probably we have to go back to our old way of eating. Okay, ma'am. And uh, there is another one question from without doing serum insulin, how to access hyperinsulinemia? See, yes. we never do serum insulin at all. Acanthosis nigricans can be easily seen. So that can be uh, easily identified. That itself will tell us that serum insulin is higher. And basic pathology is hyperinsulinemia. So no doubt about that. That will not change at all. So other things only. And surrogate markers like OGTT also help. But then for all PCOS, we need not do serum insulin at all. Okay, ma'am. Another one question from... And Dr. Mala, Saranathan, like, what is the use of investigation of OMA index, ma'am? H O M E, OMA. It is not, that is all research purposes. And it's so uh, difficult to do all these things. Already, patients, when we say PCOS, they get worried. Uh, picosa, that's what, then they go and read up everything. They are really worried about uh, PCOS. Then, on top of that, if we give unfriendly uh, investigations which are experimental, it's not at all indicated. So, only in research purposes it is used. Ma'am, another question uh, like 
how long metformin be tried in pcos see there is no definite guidelines at all and h3 clearly states it is uh, not i mean uh, uh, there is all these pharmaceutical companies have not got the permission for it to be li licensed to be used in pcos even but then there are a lot of papers so it can be given so there is no time limit at all that is 5 years 10 years like that and uh, metformin now diabetes just give it for prevention of diabetes even and it has lot of uh, um, uh, pleiotropic effect where it decreases lot of cancers so in that event i think it can be continued we have to add b12 to the when metformin is being given ma'am the next question in a pcos newly married a 25 years female means they have married since 6 months i guess ma'am so when can infertility treatment be started male factors normal uh, the question is from dr ravanita dhanalakshmi ma'am so the main thing is see uh, although she is married only since 6 months but then once they become anxious and once there is a diagnosis of pcos better to evaluate and try to find what type of pcos and it's very important to evaluate them because occasionally we identify congenital adrenal late onset congenital adrenal hyperplasia when we work them up methodically when the treatment is different so all these things if you rule out you stress on lifestyle modification you give folic acid You can start them on metformin. You can start them on uh, uh, myonostol. I mean, you know, stols. And then, if still, if she doesn't conceive, probably after three months, then we will start uh, planning ovulation induction. But otherwise, when we, uh, when most of them uh, follow lifestyle measures itself, this is what we see in our clinic. Within three months, many of them conceive. She's quite young. so i think we can wait for some time okay ma'am and ma'am uh, there is no other questions in the chat box ma'am okay thank you so if you allow us then we can end us the webinar for today ma'am okay thank you very much nice talking to you ma'am thank you for your support and we need your support in future also ma'am and thank you for spending your valuable time with us today ma'am a nice meeting you and i also uh, like to thank the participants who have been uh, patient throughout the webinar and for maintaining their dignity thank you everyone ma'am on behalf of shield healthcare i thank all the participants and the speaker especially ma'am thank you ma'am thank you thank you